There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha says that the mind is luminous or radiant, the word he uses, vipassarang. He says when people don't realize this, they can't develop their minds, they can't train the mind. When they realize that the mind is luminous and that its defilements are visitors, then you can train the mind. In other words, if you believe that greed, anger, and delusion permanently stain the mind, then you believe that you can't train yourself, you can't develop the mind. You have to depend on outside forces, outside agents to come and save you. When you realize that the defilements of greed, anger, and delusion come and visit it, in other words, they don't necessarily own it, they don't leave a permanent stain, then you can train it. Now notice the Buddha doesn't say the mind is naturally good, or that its luminosity is its awakened state. Luminosity here simply means that it knows. John Mahabhava has a passage where he says if the Buddha had said the mind is pure by nature, then you could argue with him. Well, if it's pure, then why are there defilements? How do defilements come? But the Buddha simply says it's luminous, which means it can know. Each moment we are able to be aware of things. No matter how many times greed, anger, and delusion have come into the mind, they come and they go. And there's always the possibility that you can notice their coming and going, see the effects of their coming and going, and realize that you have the choice of siding with them or not siding with them. That's what enables us to train the mind. No matter how thick the darkness of the mind, it is possible to shine a light. And once you shine the light, the darkness can't say, well, I've been here for a long time, just one little light has no right to drive me away right away. That's not the nature of darkness, it's not the nature of light. When the light comes, as soon as it comes, the darkness is gone. Now you notice in your practice that there are a lot of times the light comes and the light disappears, the darkness comes back again. That's because our clarity of mind is not yet continuous, but it is something that can be developed. As the Buddha says, we suffer from ignorance partly because of internal causes. In other words, hindrances like sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty. These things obscure the mind, and they keep ignorance going. And there's inappropriate attention. We're in looking at the world. We're not really interested in the question of suffering or how to put it into suffering. We've got other issues, other things we're more interested in. And this is related to external causes that keep ignorance going. We hang around with the wrong people. We don't listen to the Dharma. We don't take it seriously. So these are the things that keep the darkness going, even though the mind has the potential where it can know and can be aware. These other factors influence it which is why we train the mind in concentration to overcome the hindrances. And this, of course, depends on seeing at some point that the reason we're suffering is not because of somebody else, somewhere else. 
or the economic conditions or the environment or whatever. It's our own ignorance. It's that moment of clarity that makes us realize we've, we've got to work on ourselves. That's why we look for the right people, want to listen to the Dharma, want to understand it, and want to practice. It's those moments of clarity when you really see the connection between your actions and the suffering that you experience. That's when you're less willfully ignorant, and when you start willing in the other direction. As the chant just now says, you generate the desire to get rid of unskillful qualities. You generate the desire to develop skillful qualities in their place. These are all activities in the mind. That word qualities here in Dhamma can also mean actions. Remember that actions are not just things that you do with a body, but also things you do with a mind. The path is something you fabricate. It's something you will. So this is what we're working on right now, trying to make that desire for what's skillful, to have more power in the mind, so there are more moments of clarity. so we can begin to weaken the causes of ignorance. And ignorance here is not just lack of knowledge about things. It's very closely connected with inappropriate attention. We're looking at the wrong things. We know the wrong things, or we frame the issues of our life in the wrong way. We're going to get more and more consistent looking at things, first in terms of the principle of action, and then in terms of the principle of where they're suffering, what's causing it, and what we can do to put an end to it. We want to make those questions the big questions in life. We miss out on these questions because so many other questions really seem insistent. The things we pick up from our own random ideas and from the, the general values of society. Which is one of the reasons why an important part of the meditation is learning to question those values we brought up, we're brought up with, ideas we picked up from the past, our narratives about the past, the way we cast those narratives. An important part of the practice is learning to look back on your life and recast the narrative. We were talking the other day about the tendency of the mind to go over old things. And you can't just drop the old narratives of your life, pretend like they didn't happen, you've shut the door on them and you're no longer involved. They'll just slosh around in terms of the old terms in which you frame the narrative. You've got to reframe those narratives. Look at them in terms of where there was suffering, why there was suffering, and what kept you suffering on and on and on in that particular way, and where the moment was when you began to realize that you had to drop that kind of suffering. When you can look at your life in that way, then it's a lot easier to look in the, at the present moment in the right way as well. So the process of meditation is not just putting the mind through the grinder of a particular technique. It's learning to reframe the issues of life. Get a stronger sense of the importance of the questions that the Buddha asked, and the need to develop the path that can put an end to suffering. In the process of developing, we're going to be developing skillful qualities.
learning how to abandon the things that get in the way of knowledge and how to encourage qualities like mindfulness and alertness that strengthen your knowledge, strengthen your awareness, strengthen your insight and discernment. These things, just like the defilements, are not part of the nature of the mind. And John Lee has a good passage where he says, The mind is neither good nor evil, but it is what knows good and evil, and it is what does good and evil, and ultimately it is what lets go of good and evil. That luminosity of the mind is neither good nor evil, but allows you to know. It creates the circumstances by which skillful qualities can be brought into being in which they can do their work, to bring the mind to a place where it goes up beyond both the good and the evil, goes beyond that luminosity. So what this means is that the, the path is not inevitable. Someone once asked the Buddha, you know, is everybody going to gain awakening? And he refused to answer. Ananda was afraid that the man would go away misunderstanding, thinking that the Buddha was being uncooperative. And so he took the man aside and he said, suppose there was a, a fortress and there was a really good gatekeeper and there was one gate into the fortress. And so he walked around the walls of the fortress and didn't see any other means of entry into the fortress, not even a, he said, not even a hole big enough for a cat to slip through. And he would know that everybody who was going to come in and out of the fortress had to come in and out through the gate. In the same way, the Buddha realized that whoever was going to gain awakening would have to come through the path of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Seven Factors Awakening, the different sets and the wings to awakening. As to how many people would follow that path, that wasn't his business. So it's not inevitable that we're going to gain awakening. In other words, we don't have an awakened nature that forces us to gain awakening at some point. What we do have is this luminous mind that can know. It knows, it is capable of knowing that there's suffering, and it's capable of watching, developing the qualities allowed to see where the suffering comes from to see that it's not necessary, and you can put an end to it. This is important because sometimes when people gain a luminous state of mind or a wide open state of mind, they think they've hit their awakened nature. But the luminosity is not part of awakening. It's a condition that allows the mind to see. But the awakening comes from our determination that we don't want to suffer. These were John Munn's last instruction. This was his last message to his students. That discernment is your prime weapon. You're a warrior doing battle with defilement. And what is the war? The warrior is the determination not to come back and suffer again. He says you don't let go of that until it's, that determination has done its job. So there is an element of willing in the path that's necessary. Without that willing, it just doesn't happen. The luminosity of the mind is what allows the will to do its work, which allows us to straighten out our own minds, train our own minds. We don't have to go around hoping for some outside power to come and save us. We've got our ability here to see the connection between suffering and its cause and to find the path to the cessation of suffering, at which you can let go of the defilements and you can let go of the path, which are just activities, because you found something that's not an activity, something that's not fabricated. That's what we're working on. But you can't
can't clone the unfabricated. You've got to do the work. You've got to develop the, the factors that give rise to clarity of mind, clarity of vision, that can push away those clouds of defilement. When you get the causes right, the effects will take care of themselves. So try to be very clear about what you're doing, because that's a huge area where ignorance lies, around what we're doing and the results of what we're doing. We're very willful about it not wanting to admit to ourselves what we're doing or what our intentions are, and also very willful about not wanting to see the unfortunate effects of some of our actions. This is why the Buddha, when he was giving instructions to his son, focused on just this issue. Look, look at what you're going to do, look at what you're doing, and look at what you've done. Try to be very clear about the results of your actions. That activity is how you begin to see through the delusion that keeps moving in, moving in, moving in all the time. That way you begin to see that you can see through your delusion and it doesn't have to be there all the time. It's this principle that allows us to practice. This is the principle that gives us hope, confidence that there is an end of suffering. And if you act on it, there'll come the day when it's not just a hope or confidence, it's actual knowledge. that there is a deathless, and there's no suffering there. 